All right, so in this second video from chapter six, I want to introduce you to the work of Edward Chase Tolman. Um, so uh, he was a very influential researcher who um, had some uh, paradigm shifting ways of, of thinking that really contributed to this shift from behaviorism to um, the modern cognitive cognitivism. And so uh, just a little bit of background, um, born into a Quaker family, um, received a BS in elect electrochemistry from MIT and a PhD in psychology from Harvard. And he was heavily influenced by the writings of Watson and the Gestalt psychologists who we're actually gonna cover um, in part three from this chapter. And his writings are filled with whimsy and anecdotes. And uh, you know, when I look at that picture, he looks like an ang angry dude, but um, he seems like from his writing, actually not that at all. Uh, he disparaged himself and his own theories. And so he's kind of self-deprecating and funny. And so, yeah, it seems like an interesting guy. Um, and so many early behaviors held to a mechanistic behaviorism. They are, again, trying to understand predictable aspects of human behavior. Um, basically thinking of the human as a machine. And it, of course, there was a, the reason for that was because these early behaviors were reacting to introspection, saying, okay, well, we can't just be about self-reflection. We don't want to just say what's happening inside. Um, let's focus on how the machine operates and again, stimuli responses, the observable. And the mechanistic behaviorism was really searching for an understanding how, of how stimuli responses and consequences and how they're contiguous, um, how that determines behavior, how that shapes the way we act. And they ended up with a pretty, of course, reductionist uh, approach, right? Classical conditioning, operant conditioning. It's not about what are we thinking about. It's simply saying everything is reduced to the observable. It, it doesn't have this big picture, you know, questions of why and purpose and things like that, that, uh, that again, the behaviors, um, removed from their theories. They didn't want that in their theories because they thought that's not what psychology should be. But Tolman disagreed and he uh, developed what he called purposive behaviorism. Um, and again, it's, it's a transitional perspective because he was in this period of behaviorism, the 30s and 40s, and he uh, was, was shaped by that overarching uh, framework, but he was transitioning to talking about things like purpose. And so um, this is really shifting us from behaviorism to cognitivism, where psychology is uh, focused on decision making, thinking, problem solving, imagining, things like that, as opposed to observable behavior. So one of the most important um, studies that he did was what was called the blocked path study. And if I tell you this, it's going to seem unsurprising. <laughs> but for, in terms of um, uh, criticizing the behaviorism, this was really, um, this, there, this was something that the behaviorists would really struggle to explain. So, so basically, he would give rats an opportunity to walk through a maze. And first off, um, I'm sure that many of you have heard of like using rats in mazes and, you know, kind of associating that with psychology. Tolman was really the one of the first to do this. And so, um, I mean, that's really a big contribution that he made was saying, OK, this is one way we can understand psychology is letting rats navigate ma mazes. But in this study, he was, um, you know, oftentimes when they did that, it's about getting from the start to the finish and getting it there as fast as you can. And there's usually a, you know, a maze and they have to figure it out. Um, this was a more straightforward maze. It actually wasn't very difficult. Um, you could see that in the graphic there, there's a start and there's food and it's basically a straight shot. 
Now, that doesn't take them long to learn that. And um, what he studied was that, okay, if, if you give them a chance to um, learn this maze, and well, if you give them a chance to navigate it, they will, um, uh, if, if you, um, they will go straight through. But then if you block, you, it says block A, okay, what happens if you put a, a, a wall in the maze, what are they gonna do? Well, they will likely take path two, right? So path two is the fastest way there. But if you block B, what they found is that even though they could go straight, they could go to the left, they didn't do that. They actually uh, recognized that, oh, that it's blocked up ahead. And even if I take path two, I'm still not gonna get there. So they, they could see that and what they decide is I'm gonna take path three. So what they found is that the, um, they, they basically could recognize that the, um, the rats understood what was occurring. So again, you, if you block A, they would know that that straight path one is blocked. Okay, can't take that. And so I'm gonna take path two. Now, again, if you block B, they could potentially say, oh, well, this path is blocked, but I could go this way. But they recognized they created a cognitive map and said, oh, if B is blocked, of course, path one is blocked, but path two is also blocked. So I'm gonna take path three, take the long way around because that way is presumably not gonna be blocked. So they actually had a, uh, again, a map of the entire maze. And they basically could, rec they could recognize that path one and path two were the same and they're, they're gonna converge and they're still gonna be blocked if, if the block was at B. Okay, so from this, what did Tolman take away? So according to Tolman, he saw the rats learning and behavior as purposeful. They're achieving a goal. That learning involves the development of cognitive maps. So basically the, the rat is developing an internal representation between the goals that they have and the behaviors that they would use to get those goals. And they have as well a knowledge of like the environment around them. So they are they are seeing the world around them. And um, okay, how would behaviors look at that? They would look at it as response consequence. So if I take this behavior, I'm gonna have um, a consequence of getting to the um, the goal. Behaviors say if if there's no consequence, there's no learning. So if if you, um, the only way that you learn is by getting to the goal, getting to the, the food or whatever it is, the treat that they have at the end. And that they wouldn't, they wouldn't be developing anything like a, a cognitive map, anything like that. And so what Tolman showed is that um, they're learning more than just consequences. They're learning to represent the world around them. Even rats, right? Rats that seem so dumb are representing the world around them, developing maps and understanding that there's different options available to them and that and recognizing when when to use a different option. Um, another example of this is the place learning study. And so in the the beginning, this is pretty straightforward. They learn to go from the start into this big round area and then follow, uh, follow this little track here to get to a goal. And then what they did in part B is they blocked this alley, alley one, and said, okay, what, what pathway are they gonna take? So the, the rats normally would go this way, that way, that way, that way, and what, the rats ended up doing is say, well, this way's blocked, but my goal is over there. I'm gonna take this, this pathway right here. So they recognize, again, they have a map of the world around them. They recognize that when I went this way, that way, that way, that way, that I'm arriving over here and they could actually just take this pathway that was gonna go directly towards their goal. They said, well, 
uh, obviously they don't know if that's going to get them there, but that's the, that's a good, good guess to say, I'm going to go that direction. Uh, a third example of this is where, and this was a, by a student of Tolman's, they, um, monkeys love bananas. We all know that, right? Monkeys also like lettuce. They'll eat lettuce. They enjoy lettuce. Now, what they did is, um, this is a little, a little mean, but a little funny too, if, if you have my sense of humor. Uh, they put a, a banana under a bowl and then distract the monkey and then take the banana out and put in lettuce. And again, the monkeys like lettuce, but they like bananas more. So um, the, the monkey would come back, lift up the bowl, and they'd be expecting a banana. They would get lettuce. Now, again, if, if you hadn't shown them the banana, if they had a lettuce underneath the bowl, they would eat the, the lettuce, they would enjoy it. They wouldn't get too excited about it. But because they were expecting the banana, they get really upset, ag agitated, they're angry monkeys, and they flipped it over and were like, where's my, where's my banana? Um, why is that significant? Well, again, there's a behavior and then there's a consequence and there, um, it shows that expectations matter. They were expecting something, they didn't get it. And because of that, they're, they were upset, angry. And so you have to look at that as, okay, they had the consequence of lifting it up of something that they desired, but the reason was it was a contrasted with the banana, not as good, and therefore frustrating. And um, uh, the fourth one, sorry, um, is, is called latent learning. And so this is another thing that Tolman contributed. Um, so basically, he would put rats in these mazes for several days, and he wouldn't feed them in the maze. Right? So they would get fed, but outside of the maze. And they were just walking around, right? That's what rats do. So the behaviorists would say, they're not gonna learn anything. There's no consequences. There's no rewards. They don't actually learn how to get around this maze. But um, what they did later was then they were given rewards for navigating the maze. And the rats that had, um, had this chance to, to navigate it, did far better than the ones that were introduced to the maze and then al allowed to get the reward right away. So the thought is rats are learning absent of a consequence. So uh, again, what do you call that? You don't call it uh, classical conditioning. You don't call it operant conditioning because there's no consequence during that, that time frame where they're just navigating, walking around. What do you call it? Well, it, you have to think about it as there's learning that's occurring. Their behavior is different because they had that extra time. But um, again, the behaviors don't have an explanation for it. So what Tolman really did is he said, okay, um, there's, there's cognitive maps, behavior is purposive, there's expectancies, and then there's, um, what was this last one? There's there's learning that occurs outside of consequences. So all of those are really challenging the behaviorist paradigm and suggesting that we need to move to this cognitive framework. So it's the search for rewards, not the reward itself that directs behavior. It's this idea that uh, I, I want this outcome, this goal, and I'm gonna try to figure out how to get it that determines how people behave. And um, and so it's, it's really uh, reframing it as instead of saying, oh, why do we behave a certain way? It's not because of the consequence. It's because of the expectancy. And again, an expectancy is a cognitive element. We learn stimulus, instead of stimulus response consequence, we learn how to uh, develop this linking between stimuli and expectancies. And you know, well, I'm expecting with this stimulus, I'm expecting some sort of outcome with my behavior. So if we're trying to um, 
if we're trying to reinforce studying with better grades, well, um, test, you should be testing them based on what they learn while reading. Um, so if we're trying to encourage people to read, we should test them on, on reading. And that's kind of why I ask you to do these quizzes of the readings. It's because I want to show like this is important. I'm not just going to ask you to, to read and not have any questions related to it. I, I'm trying to link it all together so that you have uh, basically a, a consequence that you can say, when I read, I will, I will get this outcome. And this sort of purpose of behaviorism, it's molar, not, not reductionist. I don't know if you recall from uh, chemistry classes in like high school or, or college, but they talk about molecules, right? You know molecules, but then they talk about moles. And moles were these really big numbers. I actually forget exactly, it's 10 to the 13th or something like that. Just immense numbers. Um, more than more than trillions, and so when they're trying to talk about you know um, how many molecules are in this little test tube, well sometimes it was like trillions and trillions, and so they say oh there's uh, twelve mole, it's a number, and so it's a big 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 picture as opposed to behaviorism, which is much more focused and narrow. So when you talk about cognitions and um, understandings, uh, we can't exactly detail what is the cognitive map that the rat is developing to, to navigate this. We can't really explain exactly what's happening, but we have this bigger picture that a cognitive map that exists that helps people to navigate, helps rats to navigate. And again, um, it's it's not getting caught up in the Real specific details of the of the process. So again, this is shifting us from behaviorism to cognitivism. Uh, just a couple of notes. So Hebb, Donald Hebb, and Tolman and others like them were helping to influence this gradual transition from behaviorism to I misspelled it there, cognitivism. And the the main difference is really about um, can we use external behaviors to make valid inferences about underlying mental states. The behaviorists would say, no, you don't know what a person is thinking or uh, the cognitions that, they're, that are running through their head based on their behavior. And the cognitives say, well, if you're careful, yes, you do know something about it. So um, Hebb and Tolman were considered neo-behaviorists, right? Because they're in this sort of 40s, uh, Hebb was in the 50s. They weren't quite there in the cognitive revolution of the 60s, but um, um, but they were certainly not the typical behaviorists. All right, and I think that's my last slide, so I'm going to come back to this one in part three, and I'll wrap it up here.